Your immune system is critical for fighting off disease. But millions of people around the world are immunocompromised. Their immune system is weakened either by a genetic disorder or by chronic illnesses like cancer or diabetes. Living with such diseases is hard enough at the best of times, but in the age of COVID-19, a positive test could be a death sentence. As nations race to get their populations vaccinated, those with an already compromised immune system are often not at the top of the list. So how can overburdened medical systems keep these at-risk people from falling behind? Welcome to a new edition of the COVID-19 special here on DW. I'm Monica Johnson Berlin. Good to have you with us. And even better if you are among the lucky ones, those who already got vaccinated, because the majority have to wait their turn, even if their health is already compromised. For four weeks now, Thorsten Grabo has been at the Rostock University Medical Center in Germany. The 49-year-old was diagnosed with cancer last summer. The chemotherapy and surgery made him weak and compromised his immune system, while news about the coronavirus pandemic was dominating the headlines. Of course it's scary. You now have this extra danger out there and you don't know what's on the horizon. What are we walking into here? And what kind of impact will the chemotherapy have? Because of the high risk of infection, Thorsten Grabo lived in strict voluntary quarantine when still at home. He was separated from his family with all possible hygiene measures. He will shortly be leaving the hospital and hopes for a vaccination soon to at least get rid of the fear of COVID. That would be a huge, huge leap forward. It would be a massive relief. I'm in pretty bad physical condition. I can't imagine that I would survive even a moderate case of the coronavirus. A German government vaccination board regulates who will get the vaccine and when. Several million doses will arrive in the next few weeks. This frees up places on the waiting lists and increases the chances for younger, seriously ill patients to be vaccinated more quickly. It's a real opportunity, say experts, to have at least a little bit of normalcy. The psyche plays an important role in healing. Contacts and social surroundings are a very important resource in coping with cancer. And these are now very limited or not possible at all for some patients. And to compensate for that, along with all the other problems, is quite a challenge. Doctors should now be able to directly register their seriously ill patients for an earlier vaccination appointment. How this will work in practice needs to be regulated as soon as possible. In addition to the revised vaccination recommendations, our organization is interested in working together with the cancer centers to create a kind of point system so that we can do justice to the situation of the individual patient. This news brings a ray of new hope for Thorsten Grabo. He wants to fight for his health, a vaccination would take away a lot of his worries. And for more, let's bring in Caleb Alexander, Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Very good to have you with us. And first of all, please, what is the difference uh, between a weak or a compromised immune system uh, and a suppressed immune system? Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's a pleasure to join you and your audience. Sometimes we use these terms interchangeably, uh, a weak or compromised immune system and a suppressed immune system. But in healthcare, sometimes we seek to suppress uh, a person's own immune system using medicines in people that have autoimmune diseases, such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's syndrome. And so, Sometimes we use medicines to suppress the immune system. And in other cases, people have diseases such as cancer or HIV or advanced cardiovascular disease that weakens their own immune system. So when I have uh, either a weak immune system or my immune system has been suppressed, how does that affect my chances when fighting COVID-19? Well, it's an outstanding question, and I wish that there was a, a, a completely simple answer for you. 
of course, we can start uh, understanding that it's better to have a fully constituted uh, immune system when possible. But the effects of immunosuppression on being able to fight COVID may depend in part on why one is immunosuppressed. And there's some good news as well. For example, we've been looking at the effect of medicines that cause chronic immunosuppression, such as prednisone or tacrolimus or mycophenolate. These are medicines that are often given to people to help suppress their immune system. And what we've found is that individuals taking these medicines don't fare any worse than their counterparts if they're infected with COVID. So the, the bottom line is that uh, individuals with immunosuppression uh, need to be vigilant, uh, need to engage in what we know are evidence-based uh, public health measures, such as wearing masks and maintaining social distancing in order to minimize the likelihood of COVID infection. But the, the likelihood of severe disease, if you do get infected, may depend in part on why your immune system is being suppressed. All right. Well, that brings me exactly to the next question, because when it comes to a suppressed or a weak immune system, is the situation, the danger of getting seriously ill with COVID-19, is it the same for, you mentioned earlier, cancer patients or those suffering from diabetes, for example, and those whose immune system has been actively suppressed because of a heart and kidney transplantation? Is there a difference? I think that the totality of evidence to date suggests that the risks of severe COVID or the risks of infection may vary depending upon why one's immune system is suppressed. So I've already told you, for example, that for individuals taking medicines that suppress the immune system, that they appear to do uh, uh, okay, I mean, just as well as their counterparts if they get infected. But we do know that many people with one condition that can, that can cause immunosuppression, say cancer, don't just have cancer. Many of these individuals are of advanced age. They may have diabetes. Some may have obesity. And they may have a history of tobacco use. I mean, there are other risk factors. And so what we see that really put people at the greatest risk is not necessarily when they have one specific condition that can uh, pose potential harm, but individuals that have multiple comorbid conditions. And these stack up on one another and can really put people at increased risk of more severe outcomes. Right. And of course, there are already uh, quite a few healthy people out there. They're very skeptical, uh, skeptical uh, towards getting vaccinated. Uh, should uh, people with a weak immune system be worried? Well, I'm an active internist and I have a clinical practice and I encourage my patients, whether they're immunosuppressed or not, uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, the vaccines uh, that are out there, such as the mRNA vaccines, these are not live virus. There's no risk of causing COVID by getting these vaccines. But we do have to recognize that, that, the, that the vaccines have not been studied in large numbers of individuals with immunosuppression. So we don't have all of the information that one might wish for. I think the most likely thing is that the vaccines will ultimately turn out to be uh, less effective uh, because people may have uh, chronic conditions such as cancer or they may be taking medicines that suppress their immune system. They may not be able to mount as uh, aggressive or as robust a response to the vaccine itself. And so it's right. very important that so, so I think this is an important consideration. A absolutely, absolutely. Caleb Alexander there, Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Now, while vaccination seems to be the best way out of this pandemic, effective treatment is also important. And that brings us to one of your questions and our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Could you use convalescent plasma from people who have been vaccinated as well as from people who have recovered? This turned out to be tricky. Um, to answer, I need to run over some background again. Um, convalescent plasma is taken from the blood of people who've survived an illness and given to those who've caught the illness. It's, it's a method that's been employed with varying degrees of success to, to treat patients for, for over a century now. The idea behind it is that the antibodies to a pathogen contained 
in the blood plasma of a survivor might help hinder the emergence of full-blown severe disease in those who've been exposed to the pathogen for the first time, potentially saving lives. Um, in the current pandemic, there's still no really solid evidence from trials that convalescent plasma is definitely an effective treatment for COVID-19. But there are enough indicators that it does help when given at the right time for the FDA to approve it for emergency use in the U.S. Now, vaccines also prompt an antibody response in, in recipients. So theoretically, blood from someone who's been vaccinated could also be used to produce convalescent plasma. However, in its guidance, the FDA says people who want to donate have to have actually had the disease within the last six months, which is uh, to ensure the COVID-19 convalescent plasma collected from donors contains sufficient antibodies directly related to their immune response to infection, which is pretty vague. So no specific reason given really for why, but it's likely the decision involves the fact that approved vaccines only produce antibodies against a quite specific target on the virus, um, the spike protein. Having the disease, on the other hand, produces a wider spectrum of them. So convalescent plasma from people who've been vaccinated would be different and require its own trials, uh, confusing the picture even more for a medicinal product where the experts are still trying to clarify effectiveness. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.